Hey everybody, crafting journey out on my stroll. Somebody asked me about Pearl. Pearl doesn't like to walk. She, you know, she just hangs out at the house and waits for us to come back. Happy Friday, payday. Uh, it's almost a weekend day. And National Give Something Away today. I've got a very interesting show for you today. I listened to a parole hearing yesterday on a case that I covered not long ago. So stay tuned. Hi everybody, good morning. Happy Friday. We get to do the Friday dance. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Friday dance, Friday dance. It's Friday. <laughs> Thank God. Do you guys have plans for the weekends? I hope so. I think I'm going to. I'm not. I don't want to say it too loudly because then, like, I've made a commitment. But I need to clean the craft room. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> it's a hot mess. <laughs> you know, you just keep more and more stuff keeps creeping in, and yeah, before you know it. It's a hot mess. So, yeah, uh, I needed to, oh, man, I'm just looking around. So, how is everybody today? Hey, you guys liked that find the nude picture of me yesterday. <laughs> yeah, here up. Because, you know, it's YouTube. We can't, you know, I don't want to get banned. <laughs> Not that I would have ever shown the whole thing anyway, because, like I said, ugly naked. Anyway, so today I have a hidden gnome. So the first person that finds the hidden gnome gets to have the like button for a day and he will vacuum for you and I will pin you to the top of the comments. Just give me the timestamp where you find the gnome and bonus if you can tell me what he's got in his hand. Well, he's got two hands, <laughs> which anyway. There's a light in one hand. So what's he got in the other? Let's put it that way, okay? That makes it easy for you. And don't forget to subscribe after you hit the like button. Subscribe if you're enjoying the content. Share this with someone. Say, hey, check out this cool chick that she, you know, she makes content so you can watch it while you're crafting. And the notification bell, that's the most important of all. And check out my friend, Mickey Sunshine Creates tonight, 6.30 Central. Yep. She's going to be live. She's my co-host for The Great Escape. Guys, time's winding down. Today is, what's the day today? The 15th. Oh, it's only the 15th. You got two more weeks. I got two more weeks to work on this painting um, before I have to put it away and get out The Great Escape painting. So excited. I'm so excited. And I just can't hide it. We have so many amazing sponsors. I'll put the list right here. Oh my gosh, too many to, to mention, um, but the list is here. So you're not gonna wanna miss it. All you have to do is join the Crafting Journey Facebook group, subscribe to Crafting Journey, subscribe to Mickey Sunshine Creates, fill out the Google form. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of things, sorry. The Google form is so that we can identify you when you win a when you win one of the prizes and we can send it to you because it has all your information and then nobody can pretend to be you. Yeah, when they find out that, you know, what a great prize we're giving away. I mean, gift cards, discounts, yeah, it's pretty incredible. So, enough about that. Yeah. So I, I did get the diamond painting out back out today. Last night I was doing watercolor. Um, I'll show you some of the amazing pictures that I did last night right here in a little collage. Did you enjoy it? I had so much fun. The bicycle was fun and the tree was fun. But my sister, she stole the tree. She's like, I want that. So 
she's got the tree uh, and the flower, the pink flower that I put some shimmery um, silver glitter watercolor paint in it. Yeah, I'm trying to work on like um, like a wet on wet where I, I have a wet canvas and then I bring in some of the watercolor and it disperses it so it has more of a the watercolor feel versus an acrylic feel. Anyway, that, that makes no sense to you, but that's okay. Just between me and me. I have a wonderful show for you today. I um, watched a parole hearing. I have never seen a parole hearing. So I'm going to tell you how that went down. It's a case that we that uh, I covered on the channel, uh, the trial of Billy Ray Turner. So when we get to the crafting of crime, I'm going to tell you all about that. So... It is national. Give something away today. So as I clean up the craft the room, the, 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 as I clean up the craft room this weekend, I'm going to put together a yarn giveaway. I haven't done one in a while. And yes, Lynn, I know I owe you some yarn. Um, it's right there in, in right over there in the box. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to put together a yarn giveaway because I got too much of it. Yes, I did. And someone told me the other day, hey, you know, Mary Maxim has um, prison, prism bulky yarn on sale for $2.99. I love prism bulky. Um, it's just gorgeous yarn, $2.99. So I picked out a couple skeins that I wanted, put it in my cart, $9.99 for shipping. I'm like, oh, forget it. I mean, come on. Why are you gouging me on shipping something that weighs like a couple of ounces? Seriously? I know it was going to take $9.99 to ship a couple of skeins of yarn. They're just making money off me. So I said, no, nope, didn't get it, which is a good thing. I don't need, I don't need any more yarn. No. Plus, oh my God, every time I've got to figure out what's wrong with my arm right here, because every time I spend any time loom knitting, crocheting it just inflames the arm again and I just it makes it not not too much fun anyway so I've got my diamond painting back out and uh, I'm using a tray by Tiggs Creations she's one of our sponsors T-I-G-G-S Tiggs Creations check her out on Etsy and my pen came from Enablers Outpost. She's not a sponsor, but amazing pens. Look at this pen. It's a hybrid. It's got the wood. It's got the flowers. Beautiful pen. And it came with this beautiful gold pen placer. How awesome is that? So give something away today. National Give Something Away Day. You know, clean your closet out. Any clothes that you don't think you're going to wear anymore. You know, just... Uh, What's with this hair? Cut, clean, clean out the closet. Um, I don't know if you've got something that you just haven't used in a very long time and it still has some value, eh, give it away. Why not? Or you just give away your time, volunteer somewhere. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes, you want to talk about the crime. I know, I know, okay. Here we go. All right, let me just give you a little background on this case. All right, I should be diamond painting while I'm doing this. Um, a few months ago, I covered the trial of Billy Ray Turner for the murder and conspiracy to commit murder of Lorenzen Wright. Now, Lorenzo Wright, Lorenzen Wright was a NBA basketball player. He was married to Shar Wright. Well, at this time, they were separated. I don't know if they were divorced. They were separated. They may have been divorced. I don't remember. I don't remember. But anyway, they were on again, off again. They had six kids. She was. She lived the lifestyle, you know, because she's married to a man who's making millions of dollars, you know. So she was doing. She's doing quite well for herself. Anyway, Billy Ray Turner was her gardener. And she and Billy Ray plot to, well, she, Billy Ray, and a guy named Jimmy, her cousin, plot to kill Lorenzen. Now, according to her, Lorenzen is plotting to kill her. So she needs to kill him first. 
this is the testimony that came out. So she gathers everybody together in the living room. She's got guns on the table. She tells Jimmy, um, you know, I'm going to see, because he was from a different town. So he, she says, I'm going to loan you this car. When you get home, I want you to look in the trunk. When he gets home, he looks in the trunk. He, she, he's got a supply of drugs. He's got a supply of guns. So, you know, he was decked out. So she sends them first to, uh, at the time, she was in Memphis, living in Memphis with the kids. At the time, Lorenzen is living in Atlanta. She sends Jimmy and Billy Ray Turner to the home where it was actually an apartment or a townhouse where Lorenzen is living with other people. He's like rooming with some other people. She actually goes there because like I said, they were like on again, off again. So she goes there for a visit and she leaves a window open for them to get in. Um, so they go, Jimmy and Billy Ray, they go and they crawl into this window and they go inside and they see someone sleeping on the couch. And when they saw this person sleeping on the couch, they knew immediately it was not Lorenzen because Lorenzen's a really tall, big guy. This guy sitting on the couch was not. And there's testimony later on that uh, from the guy sleeping on the couch. Yeah, I was sleeping on the couch that night. Um, so this really did happen. So they, they get spooked. They leave. They go back and they tell Shark, no, we couldn't do it. So they do it another time. They actually do kill Lorenzen. Uh, uh, they leave his body uh, out in the middle of nowhere. They throw the guns in a lake. Um, we don't know like who the trigger person one was, but we know Shar was in on it. Billy Ray was there. Jimmy claims not to have been there, but to have come up on the scene afterwards to help them clean up and look for the weapons. Because immediately after they, Billy Ray and Shar do the shooting, they toss the weapons. And Jimmy's like, no, no, you can't. You know, we got to go find those weapons. So they find the weapons and they throw them in the lake. Fast forward, Billy Ray Turner is convicted. Now, Shar doesn't go on trial with Billy Ray because she took a plea deal. The plea deal was that she would get 30 year sentence versus the life in prison that Billy Ray Turner got. He also had a sentencing hearing this week on his other charges to run consecutively to his life sentence. One was 18 years and I don't remember what the other one was, but the man's never going to get out of jail. Meanwhile, she cops to a 30 year sentence. So yesterday I get to watch the parole hearing of Shar Wright. I'm like, parole hearing? She's been in jail for four and a half years and she gets a parole hearing? So here's how it's set up. A lot of um, teleconferencing going on, Zoom type stuff. So you've got the per I don't know if they call him a judge, the parole, the head guy, the parole guy. I'm assuming he's a judge. He's there officiating the proceedings. Then there's um, a remote room of people at the prison, which includes Shar and her family members and one person that's in opposition to her getting parole, which is her aunt. No. Lorenzo's aunt. Lorenzo's mother's sister. Yeah. Then there's another room where everybody is appearing in opposition, including uh, Deborah Wright, which is Lorenzen's mom, the uh, Lorenzen's uncle, the two investigating officers from from the crime, and the district attorney. And everybody gets to speak. So what they do is they start out and Char gets to speak. And she's going on and on about how Lorenzo was in trouble with a, a drug gang and he owed the money and this was all a plot to get money and none of it made any sense. And she was clearly accepting no responsibility for her part. And the judge kept saying, well, what about, you know, 
this meeting that you had and you hired these guys to go to his house. She's like, no, I didn't. I was, I didn't go there to, to meet with, meet up with him and leave that window open. I went there to get my kids because I knew something was going down. Well, of course she knew something was going down. She sent them there and she admits that she sent them there, but she says, I didn't leave the window open. Lorenzen had a habit of leaving the window open. Plus, the entrance is in the backyard. Why would I need to leave the window open? Plus, he left me a key. And, like, she's going on and on, accepting no responsibility for any part that she played. Now she's claiming, I was a victim of domestic violence. He would beat me if I didn't do what he wanted me to do. And I'm doing all these classes on domestic violence. And I'm I'm healing. And then her children get to talk um, Four people got to, to talk in her favor, and uh, one of her sons, her daughter, um, her friends, and I forget who else. Oh, what a lovely person she is, and she'll make a great addition to the community, and she's, you know, she, she's graduating at the top of her class from high school in the prison. She's going to be the valedictorian. Come on. They have valedictorians in prison? <laughs> Seriously? She's attending college at night. She's studying business. You know, um, okay. So then we get to hear from the opposition, which is Lorenzen's mother, Deborah. And she's a sweet little old lady, but she just blasted her. She's like, you need to serve your full sentence and the whole, the whole 30 years. For, I have a life sentence. You need to serve your 30 years. I'll see you back in 30 years. <laughs> she's not mincing any words. So then we get to hear from the uh, De Deborah's brother, the uncle of Lorenzen. Um, very well spoken. He didn't speak for, for a long time, but clearly in opposition to her getting parole. Then the, the officers who now, now the, the judge presiding over this, now he's asking questions. What, tell me some of the facts here, because I'm confused by what she was telling. Uh, none of what she said is, is in anything that I'm reading. So they told him exactly how this went down, you know, and, so once they told the judge, he, it was clear to him that she was not accepting responsibility for this. So we heard from the district attorney. We heard from everybody. Um, so at the end, the judge makes a ruling. Then it goes to, once he rules, you know, says yay or nay, then it goes to a couple of other members of the board offline later on, and they get to vote as well. Um, and then the majority rules. But all we see is him rule, although I do have the result from later on, because um, this happened like five days ago. So he says, no, <laughs> first of all, what are you doing here? It's only been four and a half years. You shouldn't be up for parole. You're not due to be up for parole until 2025. So why are you here today? So I'm denying your parole because you're not accepting responsibility for what you did. I think you need to serve more time until you can take responsibility for what you did. Um, you know, I understand that, you know, your kids want you back home and, and I get that, but you took a man's life. The person that you committed this crime with is never going to get out of prison. I'm not letting you out after four and a half years. So he says, I'll see you back in 2027 for your next parole hearing. So she, even though she'll be eligible, she originally would have been eligible in 2025 because she had this particular hearing. She can't come back until 2027. So he votes no. The thing ends. And then I hear later on that the, the entire board denied her parole crazy, crazy that she would think she could get out of prison for a murder. And the district attorney says, you know, I'm just a little, it's very exhausting to, to, um, you know, work out these plea deals with people and they're in and out of jail. And then they just come out and they commit the crimes again. You know, I put them in jail, parole board lets them out of jail, and then they go out and they commit the crime, commit more crimes. You know, they need to serve more of their time good point. I haven't done any diamond painting because I've been yik-yakking. 
Oh, why am I dizzy today? Hmm. Okay. Um. I hear a train. All right. So day eight of the trial of Kevin Eastman, and I am more confused than ever. Uh, um, I'm just going to say at this point that there is so much reasonable doubt in this case that, uh, yeah, I, I'm not even sure why it, it seems like the prosecution brought this to trial prematurely because I am not getting it. And if I were ever to commit a crime, I would hire these defense attorneys. These two gals are crackerjack. They are so good. They are really, really good at what they do. They know this, this uh, evidence game backwards and forwards and to the point where one of them was putting me to sleep yesterday. So yesterday we get the forensic scientist who analyzed the DNA. Okay. So I'm going to go through the items and I, it's going to leave you wondering too. Okay. I think I showed you the knife in the sheath, that big knife that, that brought into evidence. Couldn't test it. There was no blood on that knife, nor there was there any blood on the sheath. Now, I don't recall where they got that knife from, but there was no blood on it. Then, as you recall, Kevin Eastman, before he gets picked up at the gas station, I don't know if I told you this, before he gets picked up at the gas station, after he, you know, he's there the morning of the 16th at Troy Bonner's place, he's burning trash, um, household trash, then he leaves. One of the places he goes is Walmart. He buys a flannel shirt and a pair of pants. Now, I could be wrong in the timeline about when he went to Walmart, but at one point he goes to Walmart because they find his uh, bloody clothing in the garage on Troy Bonner's property. Um, and then when he's arrested, he, he's wearing the clothing that he bought at Walmart. So the clothing that he's bought that he bought at Walmart is what he's wearing it when he's arrested. So they tested that for DNA. So of course it just comes back to Kevin Eastman. There's nothing else on it. There's no blood on it. The duct tape that was wrapped around Scott Sessions' head. They tested that the blood on it for DNA. There was blood on it. They tested it for DNA and it comes back to Scott Sessions, of course, because, you know, it's around him and Heather Frank. More evidence that she committed this crime. Then they tested the melted plastic that was around uh, Scott Sessions' head. And it came back to Scott Sessions and an unknown contributor. So one of the things that was pointed out was uh, the unknown contributor could have been like the salesperson at the eight, you know, at the Home Depot that sold them the plastic. You never know who else's DNA could be on plastic. Um, also, something that the analyst pointed out was that fire um, and heat will degrade DNA. So it could just obliterate it. Then they test duct tape that was uh, found at the home of Heather Frank. And it has Scott Sessions DNA on it. But nobody else. Mm. Then they tested the subfloor. You know, they, they, in Heather Frank's home, they pulled up the carpet, they pulled up the, the, the mat under the carpet, and then they had the subfloor. So they took two sections of the subfloor where there was blood, and both of those came back to Scott Sessions. Then 
Then they tested several areas, uh, they swabbed several areas of Heather Frank's body at autopsy, and they found DNA of Heather Frank, of course, Kevin Eastman, and Troy Bonnell. When did she run into Troy Bonnell? Then there was some wire that was wrapped around, you know, the plastic uh, around Heather Frank's body. That was tested for DNA and came back to Heather Frank and Scott Eastman. They also tested the steering wheel and the gear shift in Scott Sessions' vehicle. As you recall, after uh, they find Scott Sessions' body, they later on find Scott Sessions' vehicle in the King Super parking lot. Well, they tested the steering wheel and the gear shift, and it just came back to Scott. Nobody else's DNA is on it. Then there was a pack of Marlboros on the body of Heather Frank. It's kind of strange, you know, like she, they just placed it on top of her, like they're trying, you know, like someone's trying to implicate someone else, you know, by placing this pack of cigarettes, just laying it on top of her body and then wrapping her up. The DNA comes back to Heather Frank, Kevin Eastman, Troy Bonnell, and an unknown contributor. Four contributors here. Now, the unknown could be someone at the store that sold the box of cigarettes. We don't know. But the other three, what? Okay, so that really supports my theory that it could have been Troy's cigarettes and Kevin was trying to implicate Troy by putting that box of cigarettes on Heather Frank's body. Now, remember I said he took off Kevin Eastman took off his old clothing and put it in the garage. Uh, that was tested for blood, and that did come back to Scott Sessions and Kevin Eastman. Now, next we get the cross-examination of this forensic scientist. And uh, I'm all for doing your homework. Yes, it was clear. This defense attorney, she did her homework. Like she knew this DNA stuff backwards and forwards enough that she was challenging her on a number of things. But it was so technical. I plus, you know, I when I'm listening to this stuff, I'm also working at the same time. And I would go back and I would rewind it and then I'd rewind it again. Then I rewind it again. I, I was lost, totally lost. To, and I know that the jury had to have been falling asleep because it was incredibly boring, incredibly lengthy. I understood none of what they were talking about. I'm waiting for the prosecution to wrap all this up in a nice bow at their closing and tell me what the heck I just heard because I don't know. And the defense can wrap that up in a nice bow and tell me what the heck they were doing there. Because it beats the heck out of me. Then they had a, a weapons analyst. Um, and she uh, analyzed the, the shotgun... Uh, casings that were found in Scott Sessions' pocket, and they didn't match. Uh, first of all, I don't even think they matched each other. I think they were two separate um, shells, and they didn't come from the same gun. Um, there was a box of ammunition found in a cooler in the garage that belonged to Kevin Eastman, Again, incredibly boring. Nothing matched anything. Like, I didn't understand. Because we there was so many weapons found on this property of uh, Troy Bunnell. They never found the revolver that Troy Bunnell said he kept at the top of that roll tool chest in the garage. 
that's never been found. So they couldn't test any of this stuff against that. But whatever they tested, the, uh, these shells and, and pockets, and it didn't match anything. So it was very short testimony. Then there was argument, not, even more confusing. Apparently, Scott Sessions owned a boomerang. And you can see it in some of the photos of that were taken of his home when they went in to search his home. Well, coincidentally, Kevin Eastman was found to have a boomerang. And this witness that they put on the sand originally thought that they were the same boomerang. So apparently after comparing them, they, it, it, it didn't turn out to be the same boomerang. But they spent so much time on this boomerang. <laughs> At the end, and then the prosecutors are like, I have no more witnesses today. So, you know, so I don't know who we're going to get tomorrow. But just an incredibly, incredibly boring, boring day. Boring. Did I say it was a boring day? That's why I was watching the parole hearing. Because parole hearing was really interesting. <laughs> now, I got to believe that uh, at this point... The prosecution's got to be winding down. Although, like I said, I still haven't, you know, I haven't found a smoking gun. We don't know where the smoking gun is in this case. How are they going to get rid of the reasonable doubt that there is against this Kevin Eastman? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And what is the defense going to be? Is, is he going to take the stand in his own defense? Will we see multiple personalities? That would be interesting. <laughs> like if he was on the stand and he really did have disassociation disease and one of the personalities came out, you know, everywhere, 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 everywhere. <laughs> that would be really freaky. <laughs> so now the other thing that we're expecting today, I don't know if it's going to happen, but uh, Rebecca Rudd, case I covered a couple weeks back. She is the woman over in Missouri who um, allegedly burned her 16-year-old daughter uh, in a burn pile um, and it was on trial for murdering her daughter. Um, we're, that was decided by the judge and he is supposed to give his ruling by today. He said he would have a ruling by July 15th. So I'm wondering if that's going to come out today should be interesting. This woman, uh, Rebecca, the defendant, opted not to have a jury trial. She opted to have the judge hear her case. So, so on this day in history, in 2006, Twitter is launched. Woo -hoo -hoo. I don't use it. <laughs> I never understood it. Never understood Twitter. I, I can handle any other social media. I don't understand Twitter. And for the simple fact that Trump used Twitter to advocate his position during his years in office. Would That alone kept me away from Twitter. But uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't do Twitter. So on this day in history, the San Francisco-based podcasting company, Odeo, officially released Twitter, and it was spelled T-W-T-T-R, and it was later changed to the Twitter that we know now. It's supposed to be an SMS short messaging service. This was kind of like a side project of Odeo's main podcasting platform. It was a free application where users could share short messages with groups that they belong to. It's also known as a micro blogging service. I gotta learn more about this Twitter. I always say that and then I don't do it. Like I have enough on my plate. It is now one of the world's leading social media platforms. Now, Twitter's user base is much smaller than Facebook, and I prefer Facebook, quite frankly. 
So that is the show for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to hit the like button. He's got, Someone's going to get the like button to come visit their house. Yes, if you found the gnome in today's show, just put the timestamp in the comments. All right. Take care, everybody. Love you. Bye. <laughs>